Hello and welcome to this talk on the topic of vault attacks on CCA secure lattice camps. My name is Peter Pessel and the paper this work is uh, this talk is based on is joint work with Lukas Bokop. So I think you've already heard your fair share on the topic of quantum computers and John's algorithm and whatnot, but still to get everyone on the same page, uh, NIST is currently running a standardization process uh, for post-quantum cryptography. And this standardization process is currently in the third and kind of final round. And amongst the finalists are three lattice-based key encapsulation mechanisms, namely Kyber, Andrew, and Sabre. Uh, and NIST is expected to pick one out of these three for standardization by the end of this year. So that's very soon. Now, this process is also quite interesting when it comes to, to the application in embedded devices, because these free lattice-based CAMs are actually quite a nice fit for such resource-constrained devices, as they can uh, typically outperform in terms of runtime, uh, classic public key cryptography such as RSA and ECC. That's of course nice, but performance isn't everything in the embedded world because these devices are typically shipped to God knows where, they are out somewhere in the field, this, which means that they are accessible to attackers, which of course opens the gate to implementation attacks. Now, when we uh, want to look at implementation attacks for such relatively new schemes, there are two main challenges that we need to tackle. And the first is to actually find and understand vulnerabilities, to find out how we can attack them. And then in the next step, to find appropriate countermeasures to protect against the attacks. Now, uh, what's the current status of implementation attacks and countermeasures of such lattice-based camps? Well, for the first big category of implementation attacks, that is that of side-channel attacks, such as uh, power analysis e, uh, or EM measurements, stuff like that. Well, there are already a couple of uh, works published. So we have seen various attacks ranging from differential power analysis to algebraic single trace, multi-trace attacks to side channel assisted chosen ciphertext attacks. And we've also seen the first protected in terms of masked uh, implementations of these camps. Now the picture is quite a bit different for the second big category of implementation attacks, which is uh, fault attacks. There's actually very little published work on fault attacks on these lattice-based CAMs, um, and thus also quite uh, little information on how to achieve protection. It's difficult to protect against something which you don't know what it looks like. Now, uh, these free CAMs are also interesting in one way in that they quite share a lot of high level similarities, which makes them uh, interesting to analyze because when you find an attack or a countermeasure, then this attack or countermeasure might apply to multiple schemes instead of just one of them. And for instance, uh, two of the schemes, Kyber and Saber, uh, can be seen as more or less direct descendants of an encryption scheme by Lubashevsky, Pikat, and Rosen. And uh, this scheme is colloquially known as the LPR encryption scheme. LPR is a CPA secure public key encryption scheme, which bases its security on the hardness of the ring learning with errors problem. And another similarity that actually all three lattice-based CAMs, so Kaber, Cyber, and Andrew share, is that they use some variant of the Fujisaki Okamoto or FO transform. Uh, the FO transform in general uh, transforms a chosen plaintext secure public key encryption scheme to a chosen ciphertext secure key encapsulation mechanism. And the basic idea behind this FO, you can see in the, in the figure below, which shows a simplified variant of, of an FO, of a possible FO, it works as follows. It first takes the ciphertext uh, and decrypts it with a secret key SK, and as a result, you get a message M. You then re-encrypt this message M 
using the public key and a randomness which is generated in some deterministic manner here in this figure it's done by hashing the message and together with the public key and then you take the output of this re-encryption and compare it to the ciphertext you originally received and you return the secret uh, the shared secret k only if these two ciphertexts match. If they don't match, then you uh, have to conclude that the ciphertext you received was tempered, wasn't honestly generated. Uh, and so you might return, for instance, a, a, a random shared secret or an error signal, something like that. Now, what's interesting here from an implementation security perspective is that, is that well, we from an implementation security, we know this picture. We often do for instance, in the AES, we take uh, a ciphertext, decrypt it, then re-encrypt it and check if, if uh, the ciphertexts then again match. Uh, and we use this as a fault countermeasure. So this is unintentionally kind of a, a built-in fault countermeasure. This, of course, then begs the question, well, if if these schemes have like a built-in fault countermeasure with this Fujisaki Okamoto transform. Do we even need to care about faults anymore? Or do, do we just need to protect this transformation or whatnot? Well, as you might have guessed from the title uh, of this talk, is this still very much possible and practical to attack? Uh, uh, these schemes, which we show by presenting such an attack, so our conclusion is, yes, the F Fujisaki Okamoto is a fault deterrent. It makes them makes attacks more difficult, but it's not a countermeasure as such. So uh, fault attacks are still possible. Uh, our attack works by uh, skipping an instruction at a specific spot. And the trick is then to not observe the, the output of of the uh, the output of the decapsulation, which would be the shared secret directly, but instead just making a binary uh, observation and to test does uh, the is the shared secret still the correct value or is it something else, which means uh, a fault or uh, was detected. Now this outcome actually carries information on the private key and after uh, gathering enough information over many invocations of the decapsulation where in, we, in each invocation we uh, inject the fault, we solve for the key and we can uh, attack Kyber and uh, New Hope, which is a scheme that was didn't advance into the third round. Uh, with a minimum of 6,000 faults. But uh, we also highlight that our attack has the potential to also be applied to other schemes because of the aforementioned, aforementioned similarities uh, between them. Now, uh, in order to explain this attack, I have to uh, give you a brief introduction into this LPR encryption scheme. I like to always uh, describe it as a kind of noisy Elgamar encryption. So uh, this LPR works in elements in RQ, which is a polynomial ring uh, where all uh, coefficients are taken modulo a, a relatively small number. For instance, in Kyber, this is uh, 3,329. And so all elements are polynomials uh, modulo a, a, a polynomial x to the m plus 1, where this n is, for instance, 256. So again, all elements are polynomials. And what's, interest, uh, what's uh, important for this attack is that you can rewrite um, a polynomial multiplication, c equals a times b, as a matrix vector multiplication where these vectors C and B are just the, the coefficient vectors and you get this matrix A, the, the if uh, column of this matrix A by multiplying the polynomial A with X to the I. And again, take this modulo X to the M plus one. Uh, so a key generation works as follows. First, you sample 
two secret polynomials s and e from an error distribution chi and this chi is some narrow distribution and for instance kyber uses a binomial distribution which is centered over uh, zero and with a nar very narrow range so it goes from minus two to plus two uh, then in the second step of key generation you sample a uh, uniformly random polynomial A, and then B, which is, is essentially the public key together with A, is computed as A times S plus E. So it's a noisy product. Now the public key, as said, is A and B, and the secret key is S, and you can discard the second uh, polynomial E. Now encryption works as follows. The first step you sample uh, three uh, polynomials again from this error distribution. So these polynomials are R, E1, and E2. Uh, then you compute this U and uh, V as shown here. And you then encode the message M onto V by encoding uh, the message onto a, a polynomial. And you do that by typically uh, multiplying each of the 256 message bit with Q over two. So each polynomial, uh, so to each coefficient, you either add zero or Q over two. And decryption then takes this ciphertext UV and computes M prime equals V minus U times S and feeds that into decoder. And then you return uh, the message. So uh, why does this actually work? Well, if you do a back substitution, so you take this M prime equals V minus U times S, you get this, this is equal to M times Q over two. So this is the encoded uh, message plus some additional terms, namely R times E minus E times S plus E. And if you remember all these, all these additional terms are sampled from this narrow error distribution, which means that all of them are uh, small and which means that this M prime is approximately M times Q half, which means that we can use a decoder uh, to recover the coefficient. And as you see in the figure below, where we plotted uh, uh, an example of a coefficient wise probability distribution of this M prime, you have two peaks and the first peak is around zero, which corresponds to the zero bits. And the second peak, which is drawn with this dashed line, which is centered at Q over two, uh, corresponds to the one bits. And you can use then a decoder to tell if a bit was either zero if it's closer to zero or if it's if a bit was one if the coefficient is closer to, to q over two now again uh these uh uh, this LPR scheme is only uh, chosen plain text secure and to make it into a, something CCA secure, which we typically need, we use the Fujisaki Okamoto transform and uh, might look something like this. Now this as said, this is quite interesting from the perspective of uh, fault attacks because you have this built-in countermeasure. So we have to, uh, if we want to mount a countermeasure, we have to think about, okay, where can we now in actually inject the fault such that we learn something? And the first thing where we might want to inject a fault is into this uh, equality test. So if the outcome of the re-encryption uh, is equal to the ciphertext that received that we received. So this uh, for, so we fault this equality test such that it out, always outputs one. So it tells okay they are equivalent, even if they are not, and which means that we would always get. Uh, the shared secret, the output of this key derivation function, so the shared secret K. Now, this attack is already known. It was already described by a couple of uh, previous works, um, but it's also a, a 
fairly easy to protect against. I'm not saying trivial, it's never trivial, but easy in that uh, this equality test and this multiplexer at the end is a, a very uh, small part of the overall decapsulation in terms of runtime. And we already know that we have to protect it and there are ways to protect it. And uh, since there are such as only a small part, we can uh, uh, throw a couple of countermeasures at it and it doesn't matter if they are a little more expensive. Okay, now what if we fold these three blocks in the middle? So the hash function, which derives this uh, the randomness R and this pre-secret big K, uh, and the re-encryption, the key derivation function. Well, these blocks are essentially what make up the encapsulation, because in encapsulation, we choose a random message and we run uh, these three blocks, which means that if the attacker uh, was the one who who computed the ciphertext, who ran encapsulation using the public key, got the ciphertext and then sent it to the device, then these three parts in the middle actually only process known data. So they recompute this R and K and so, so there is not a, lear, a lot to, to learn when we inject a fault here because we already know the values that are processed and yeah, we don't learn anything here. Which leaves us with the decryption, which is also kind of the most uh, uh, straightforward or the first thing you think about on attacking with a fault, since decryption is also the one component that uh, uses the secret key. Now, when we do a fault attack, we typically think of it in this way that we inject a fault into a component. The output of this component changes in some manner and we use this changed out uh, outcome to compute backwards to derive some information on the secret key. Now here with this FO transformation, there is a problem. If this message that we recover, this M, changes in any sort of way, then the re-encryption step will of course output a completely different ciphertext. It has nothing to do. So this ciphertext will, of course, not match the received ciphertext, which means that we will always get a random shared secret K and a random shared secret doesn't convey any information on the secret key, of course. So we have to find another way. And actually, if we look at this, well, we can inject a fault into this decryption function, but we can only deduce one bit of information then uh, on the fault. Namely, is this K that we receive at the end actually the correct one? So the same one that the attacker got during encapsulation or is it something random? So did this K change or not? This is the only bit of information that we can extract. So this is what we try to do in our attack. We inject a fault in the decryption and then test if either the correct K is still returned or a random K is returned. And as said, the, we assume that the attacker is the one that ran the encapsulation, meaning that he knows uh, the, the shared secret K, which means he can test uh, whether or not the correct K is returned and the outcome which mean the outcome meaning uh, the bit if it's correct or not uh, carries information on the key uh, i have to quickly introduce some terminology here we call a fault an effective fault if uh, a random k is returned effective means in that the fault did do something it changed something and it we, we called we call uh, the other case, namely that the correct K is returned an ineffective fault, the, the, so the fault didn't do anything. So uh, here I have to uh, give a brief example and also clear up something. So an ineffective fault does not mean that the fault injection as such uh, 
didn't work. So we inject the fault and it always, the fault always does what we intended to do. But in some case, this fault doesn't have an effect on the outcome. So despite this fault, the correct outcome is still returned. This might be a little counterintuitive, so a quick example. So for instance, consider the, uh, the test is xx smaller than 10. So this is a Boolean test, uh, so a test, and it, it returns one bit, true or false. And how a, a, any computer would typically uh, check for this is that it takes this x, subtracts 10, and tests for the sign bit of the difference. Now think of it, a, a faulted egg which skips the subtraction step, which is just an instruction skip. So this would mean that the device instead of is x smaller than 10 actually tests if, a, if x itself is uh, if x is smaller than zero. Now in many cases uh, this uh, the outcome of this computation is actually the same as x smaller than 10. So, which means if you put in the numbers, the, the outcome only differs if x is between 0 and 9. So only if it's uh, between these values, then the fault is effective. Meaning that if we observe that a fault was effective at the output, that the output of a larger operation somehow changes, then we know that uh, this x was between uh, 0 and 9. So we have learned something about the value. Now is the question, where can we actually inject such a fault into a, into decapsulation uh, such that uh, we can learn something about the key? And we've actually found a place, namely the decoder, which is the component which recovers the original message M from the noisy version M prime. Uh, so this decoder is called for each coefficient. It takes as input some number between uh, zero and Q and outputs a single bit, zero or one. So even if we were to inject a random fault to anything in this decoder, then uh, the outcome would be correct with a probability of around 50%. But of course, uh, we, want, we need to be a little more clever than that. The other, so we can't just throw something random in there. Now uh, we use an assumption here again that the attacker runs the encapsulation, so he knows all the internal, internal intermediate values that occur during encapsulation and also during the re-encryption, and he then sends the ciphertext to this uh, to the device, and he gets so and. Uh, as you remember, this M prime is an, a noisy version of this M. Now, if we have a closer look at this M prime, then of course the first component is this M times Q over two and that the attacker knows. And for this other term, which we call the, the, the noise or error term, this R E minus E one S plus E two, then uh, the terms then the polynomial R, E1, and E2 are the ones that are uh, sampled at the beginning of the encapsulation, uh, of the uh, encryption, that's also of the encapsulation, which means that the attacker knows them. And this E and S are actually the secret key. So this S is actually the secret key, and this E is this other polynomial that was used during key generation, but it's also, uh, so it's this E is not stored as part of the secret key, but it also needs to be kept secret. Now, what you have here is actually that this M prime is linear in the key. You, you multiply something known, R, with something unknown, and multiply this E1, this known E1 with uh, something unknown, which means that if you know something about this M prime, other than where what the original message was, so if you know something on what on the concrete value of this M prime, then you learn something which is linear in the key coefficients. Now to actually exploit it, we have to uh, have a closer 
look at how decoding is actually done. And for that, I uh, give here uh, the actual decoding function as it is used in Kyber. Uh, you can, of course, write a decoder in any other way, but this is a nice way, which is a uh, constant time, which is, of course, important for uh, uh, security. Now, the first step in this decoding routine, it takes the input A and shifts it to the left by one. Uh, shifting by left to the one is nothing else than a multiplication with two. So uh, on the left figure, we have the, the coefficient wise probability distribution of this M prime and what shifting so here in the range between zero and Q. And again, the, the, the solid line corresponds to a message bit zero and the dashed line to a message bit one. And what multiplication by two does it, well, it just scales the, the X axis. So it instead of from zero to Q goes from zero to two Q. Uh, then in the next step, the decoder adds the constant Q over two which again, just shifts the distributions to the right. So instead of beginning at zero, it begins at Q over two, everything is shifted to the right. Then the, the third uh, step in this uh, decoder is a division by uh, Q. So what this does is the following. So between zero and Q, so this is an integer division, so it always rounds down. So between zero and Q, we have zero. Between Q and two Q, we have a one. And between two Q and five Q half, we have uh, a two. And then this end with one, uh, so it selects the least significant bit, which means that for a two, the, the least significant bit of two is a zero. And here you have it that uh, the, the solid parts always map to a zero and the dash parts uh, always map to a one. So the decoder works correctly. Okay, where can we actually inject the fault? Well, we found that if you skip this second step, this, multi uh, this addition of Q over two, then you have the following situation that, uh, that uh, depending on the actual uh, value of M prime, uh, the outcome is either correct or incorrect. So if we have a look at the solid lines for a zero, then the right part of this Gaussian distribution is actually again, right. I mean here the, between uh, zero and Q4. So we posit on the positive side of the Gaussian distribution. Uh, then this part is still correctly decoded to a zero, whereas the red part of uh, the zero bit is uh, incorrectly decoded to a one bit. And we have the, the same picture for a one bit. So the right part of this kind of Gaussian distribution is correctly decoded to a one bit, and the left part is incorrectly decoded to a zero bit. So which means that we actually from observing if the decoder still uh, recovers the correct message or an incorrect message, we know we can learn something about uh, this M prime. And since for a, and since it's the exact same picture for a zero bit and a one bit, the right half is always correctly decoded and the left half is not correctly decoded, we can write down an inequality, namely that this error term are e minus e times e1 times s plus e2, the eth coefficient, which is the coefficient we fault, uh, is either larger than one if we observe that the fault was ineffective, meaning that the correct secret was uh, the correct shared secret was still returned in the decapsulation, or it is smaller than one if the fault is effective. So this is nice because uh, we have this now this inequality. And uh, as I've said quite at the beginning, this matrix, we can use this matrix vector notation to extract uh, one line of this uh, system. So we can uh, extract the computation of the if coefficient uh, of this uh, polynomial uh, computation. And what's also nice is that this error term is, of course, always 
small, it has to be always uh, smaller than Q over four, because otherwise uh, there would be uh, decryption errors, which we of course don't want. And since this is always small, we can just drop the modulus here and say, this is an inequality over Z, so over the integers inequalities over uh, in a modular field, modular field don't make, make much sense anyway. So what we have here is a linear inequality with two n unknowns. So remember that n is the is the, the, the degree of the reduction polynomial and also the number of coefficients. And we have two n unknowns, which are the coefficients of e and s. And this inequality is over the integers. Now, of course, one such inequality doesn't it does carry information about the secret key, but of course not a lot. So we have to repeat this step. So we, uh, the attacker generates many ciphertexts, sends, then sends them to the device. He faults uh, one coefficient per decapsulation call, and then, which means per fault, he gets one inequality and he uh, gathers these inequalities in a larger system. And this system looks like this. So for each fault, we have an, an R and an E1 that we bunch up together in this matrix. We multiply it with E and S, and then e, depending on the outcome of the fault, so the outcome of the fault uh, the, uh, determines the signedness of the inequality, so either uh, greater than or less than. And on the right half, we have this E2, uh, so we just picked this E2 from here and put it onto the right side. And now we have a, a, a large set of inequalities and we need to find the key. How can we do that? Well, our first thought was that we do it in some analytical manner so that we uh, think of these inequalities as some sort of constraints and then we we uh, threw a solver at this system of constraints this didn't work out all that well and um, might also be not that great because uh, fault attacks can maybe not work so the fault injection as such which means that uh, some uh, some signs in there might actually be incorrect. And if we do an analytically exact approach, one, even one incorrect inequality might throw off the entire solver and thus uh, the, the system might be unsolvable. So what we did instead is we used the following observation. If we replace these larger than and, and smaller than signs with an approximate sign, then this looks kind of like a linear decoding problem. So a AX equals B, and we have to find the X that matches the closest. So since this is kind of similar to a linear decoding problem, we use an algorithm that is often used in linear decoding, and that is that of uh, belief propagation. So to explain that process, um, I extract here one uh, uh, line of the system. So this x1 to x2 to the n is, for instance, the first line here on the left. This, so it contains n components, uh, n coefficients of r1 and n coefficients of e11. And now this y1 to y2n is uh, uh, composed of the coefficients of the unknown coefficients of e and s. And uh, in this example, we say that this scalar product, this one line in the system of inequalities has to be larger than zero. So what we do here is uh, we actually store the probability distribution for each coefficient. And we initialize the probability distribution with uh, the distribution of this error distribution, so this chi, which is a centered binomial distribution over a very narrow range. And now we do the following. For each uh, index i, so between 1 and 2n, and each 
inequality that we gathered, we compute this marginal distribution. So the, the probability distribution that this scalar product uh, is uh, larger than zero in this example, uh, conditioned that uh, on the assumption that the i-th coefficient of y takes in a certain value. And how we do that is the following. We compute the probability distribution of this scalar product, x, but we leave out the i-th uh, coefficient. And then we might get a distribution that is kind of like this. So again, it's kind of like a, a Gaussian distribution, but it's, it's uh, not centered at zero anymore. Now we enumerate all possible values, all realizations of y uh, i. So if, uh, if it's a centered binomial distribution, these are all values between minus two and plus two. So just five values. For each of these values, we predict the product of x i y i and then uh, compute the probability distribution of the entire scalar product. So essentially we just shift the curve accordingly to the predicted product x i y i. So this might look something like this. For the, for the green value of y, we shift to the right. And for uh, the, the red value, we shift to the left. And for the orange value, for instance, if y is zero, then it stays in its place. And finally, we use the restricted area. In this case, because we say it has to be larger than zero, we take the right part of this, of this distribution and we use this area as the likelihood. Then we update the distribution, meaning we perform a, a base step over all the inequalities, and uh, which gives us updated distribution for each y for each uh, secret coefficient. And then re we repeat this step. So again, compute marginals, do an update, marginals update, etc., until uh, we reach uh, convergence. So this is kind of like a simplified version of belief propagation. And it turns out that this approach works quite well. Uh, we implemented and tried out the attack for the schemes New Hope and Kyber. And we also attacked a masked implementation of a decoder. Now, masking is uh, not really a countermeasure against faults, but rather against a side channel analysis. But still, if if we have, want to have a protected device, then it also needs to be protected against side channels. And if a side channel countermeasure already destroys a, uh, this attack venue, then we don't need to care about it. But we uh, uh, also attacked uh, mask implementations of uh, uh, which means that masking as such is not a countermeasure. Uh, we then uh, determined the success rate of of our attack using simulations for a varying number of fault injections. And for the smallest Kyber parameter set, Kyber 512, we need 6,000 or a little more than 6,000 fault injections to uh, recover the uh, secret key. And of course, for the larger parameter sets, we need more faults since the keys are larger, there is more information in the keys. Um, to uh, actually see if this attack also works on a real device, we verified the attack by attacking a microcontroller. So we had an ARM Cortex M4, uh, a chip with an ARM Cortex M4 core running Kyber 512, and we injected the described faults with clock glitches. And of course, this uh, was also successful. Um, so what this means now is that th this attack is quite practical because we did it, as it has to be practical. This means that the, the Fujisaki Okamoto transform that all these lattice-based cams use is a fault deterrent. It probably makes fault uh, attacks harder, but it doesn't rule them out. Attacks are still possible. I'd like to also add that we demonstrated the attack for two schemes, Kyber and New Hope, 
but uh, similar attacks for other schemes very likely exist because, as I said in the beginning, there are quite some similarities. So the attack might look a little bit different, other instructions skipped or whatnot, but it's, I think, likely that uh, such attacks exist for other schemes as well. And of course, what we showed here is one particular instance of, of such an attack. So we said we had to skip this one very particular instruction, but of course we don't rule out and it's very likely that there are similar attacks where you fold other instructions or you use other techniques, like for instance, a bit flip at certain positions and something like that. So the general idea of, of, of um, of, uh, of injecting a fault and then see if it's effective or ineffective uh, can be used probably somewhere else as well and in other schemes. Um, and my personal opinion is that we've already seen great progress in the implementation security of all sorts of uh, post-quantum uh, post uh, schemes, but as this attack shows, which is one of the first attacks on lattice-based cams, the, the topic is far from solved. There is still lots of work to do. And remember that the first picks are done by NIST this year. So there is absolutely no time to lose. And we have to continue uh, looking at the implementation security of these schemes. Now, what security for uh, against uh, this uh, this specific attack might look like? How can we protect against this very specific attack? Well, since uh, we inject a, a an, an instruction skip, we might use something that detects directly uh, detects the instruction skip as such, such as fine grained control flow integrity. But um, such a fine-grained uh, control flow integrity often needs some sort of hardware support to compute checksums along the way or something like that. And as I said, there might be other attack paths which don't use an instruction skip, but instead a bit flip or something like that. Now, the next thing that one usually does against all sorts of uh, fault attacks is double execution. So you uh, compute an operation twice and then check if the same result comes out. Uh, so the, we've already heard the if the same result comes out once before, namely in terms of the Fujisaki Okamoto transform, which checks the ciphertext which means that double execution might also not work because if we inject a fault, we don't care if it's the Fujisaki or Kamoto transform that tells us if a fault was effective or ineffective, or if it's the double execution countermeasure that tells us if a fault is effective or ineffective. So this means that the double execution has to be done on a very fine grained level in the decoder might be even that you have to check after each and every CPU instruction, which might get expensive. And even then in some circumstances, uh, uh, double execution doesn't help at all. We found an attack on new hope in which double execution, even double execution for each uh, instruction doesn't help. So what helps against our uh, instance of the attack against this very specific instruction skip is the shuffling countermeasure, which means that uh, you don't apply the, uh, the decoder uh, in a fixed order on each coefficient of, the, uh, of, this, uh, of this M prime, but in some randomized fashion. This means that you can still inject the fault and you can even detect if it's ineffective or effective, but you don't know which coefficient you actually hit and you need this information to actually set up uh, this inequality. You need to know which information you actually targeted. And as a nice bonus, uh, the shuffling countermeasure, you also employ it typically to, to protect against uh, side channel analysis. 
So uh, to close off, uh, we put uh, our source code, so our attack code and simulation code on GitHub, which means that you can go there, uh, check out the code, uh, uh, run uh, all the simulations, and even or try to adapt the attack uh, or build on it. Now that's it from my side. Uh, thank you for watching.